Okay. Um, so, uh, I am so happy to now kick off the more substantive component um, of uh, our event with, with coverage of some basic principles um, of modeling. And when I teach this boot camp, sometimes I start with uh, diving into models, getting a direct experience of, of, of a model, delivering what I sometimes call a buzzing, blooming confusion of uh, about about modeling. And then I jump into conceptual material. Here, I I thought I'd, I'd begin with uh, an invitation to system science that I, I hope will convey some understanding of the basic principle, situate us to understand where modeling fits in. And then explore some models together with, with that understanding of where, how they play a role. Okay. So um, uh, I'm going to be covering this material um, uh, in a way that, that articulates a particular things. One that I've indicated in some comments already. Um, and, it, and that is woven throughout this boot camp. Um, but it's related to, to some questions I got in the survey responses. And so I thought I'd cover it a little bit more deeply than I than I sometimes do. Okay. Um, so we're going to be covering uh, some discussion of motivations for system science. Uh, I'm going to introduce system science, sometimes called complexity science, the science of the whole. Uh, and we're going to be then looking at this this um, construct of, of dynamic models within this context and how they're used, the roles they play within our, our, our um, uh, within our, our modeling um, and our modeling processes. We're gonna talk a little bit about models and data because I think in my experience, this is an area where a lot of health scientists trip up on the role models play and 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 then hitting some take home points. So broadly when I when I think about this area um for health scientists um one of the recurring themes I find when when I speak to health scientists interested in this area maybe you know the screen looks a bit washed out here. Could could one of the TAs get the um get the those uh, lights yeah that's is that better? Yeah, okay, okay, thank you, thank you. Um, one of the recurring themes I hear in the health science area is that people are drawn to system science because of the perceived difficulties, the, the seeming intractability of certain problems to purely being handled with traditional tool sets. Um, th the fact that many conditions just fall fall prey to features that cannot be um cannot be reduced to the strong assumptions associated with randomized clinical trials um where you may have this sutava the standard unit treatment value assumption for example uh or or to purely an associational analysis and whether it's you know syndemics of mutually interacting conditions um, dealing with certain communities that are struggling at once with with high um, levels of chronic disease and, and, and communicable disease and, and behavioral um, uh, behavioral concerns as well, social issues, whether it's mental health uh, gaps um, uh, between uh, those those communities and from where we'd like to be, particularly for for teens. The life course impact of early life insult, where, right? Uh, an area illuminated early on by Barker looking at uh, deprivation in the early years of life and its its manifestation in chronic disease, you know, six decades later or five decades later in rates of smoking and and and, and substance use. Um, or whether we're dealing with, you know, um, multi-complication conditions like diabetes, which 
which has this pernicious effect across many organ systems um, with peripheral neuropathy and retinopathy and nephropathy, for the kidneys, um, heart disease, et cetera. Um, uh, you know, we look at health disparities and inequities within our systems and the, the fact that often in our health care systems, our formal systems of care, um, we have this poor frag this fragmentation and poor coordination, or sometimes, you know, problems in one area pop out in another. Um, lack of availability of community care comes out of all places in long waits for emergency care. Um, we, we have these systemic problems. Um, and at, at first glance, those may seem totally different. And traditionally in the health sciences, they've often been studied through very different lenses with some being in the realm of, of, uh, of, of social epidemiology, others being in the realm of you know, emergency medicine or in the realm of, uh, of addictions medicine or what have you. But the truth is all of these share certain common features. They all share certain characteristic underpinnings. They're all, they all constitute what is at a technical, not merely a vernacular level, complex systems. We use the term complex in, in kind of a day-to-day -day way that's in our vernacular that's very loose. Often it's used sort of synonymously with complicated. But you can have a system that's very complex, but not complicated. And you can have a system that's very complicated, but not complex. What distinguishes complexity is that we, we have a situation where the whole can be very different than the parts. Um, the behavior of the whole is, cannot be reduced to, cannot be, cannot be analyzed in term, terms of, of simply its pieces. It's the interconnection between the pieces and almost invariably some amount of nonlinearity in those, in those interactions that, that distinguishes behavior at a higher level from that of its pieces. Just as like you cannot understand a traffic jam by studying the make and wheel size and engine size of each car in it. A traffic jam as a phenomenon cannot be reduced to its, to its constituent parts. Relationship challenges in a intimate partnership cannot be reduced to merely an understanding of one person in isolation or the other person in isolation. It's the interplay between them. It's not the pieces, it's the connection between them. And often it's a very special feature of those connections, which is that they examine, they exhibit this feature of nonlinearity at a technical level. Now, in these systems, cause and effect are often unclear. We see something happening. It's not clear exactly why. It's sort of from a high level. Um, sometimes we undertake an action. We don't see the effects really borne out for a long period of time. Often it's multifaceted. It appears over a, a broad area. And often it's reciprocal. You know, um, uh, weight may affect social anxiety, may, which may impact uh, in turn uh, a person's weight. Um, or someone's being stigmatized from a, from a uh, substance use problem may lead to more substance use, which may lead to further stigmatization. There's reciprocal connections. And often these systems react surprisingly and pervasively to interventions. We intervene one place, and it has many effects across the system, and, and often those that are somewhat surprising. Sometimes we get worse before we get better. It, we take an action like trying to find um, hidden cases, and it makes our case counts look bad for gonorrhea for the, for the first little bit. But then once we find cases enough and we're treating them, the numbers go down. Um, so we may undertake an intervention that makes it seem like it's gotten worse, but then it makes it better. And the, the reverse can be true too. Um, so uh, often because they 
these effects are surprising and because they're pervasive, it can be seen very hard to control these, these systems or, or to influence them, to intervene on them effectively. Now, underlying these features are a set of characteristics of these systems. All of those systems I listed earlier, feedbacks, nonlinearities, almost invariably that for any of those, those can be prominent. Um, interagent interactions, network structures, learning or adaptation, um, localized effects and delays, and um, and uh, sort of individual decision making based on a local context. Wait, yes, um, yeah, okay. Jun Chao asked, "Is surprise a real property?" Uh, this is a good question. So when we have complex systems. Um, they, they tend to be associated with this element of surprise. And Jun Chiao asked, sensibly, look, is that inherently a part of this system? Or is it simple ignorance, lack of ability to, to think things through on the part of an observer? Um, what I would say is related to this transition from this side, these underlying features shared by those systems on the one hand that are that give rise to certain properties. They give rise to, to the properties of this. And one of them is, is associated with these unexpected surprise behaviors. Now, someone could say, is there, you know, um, is it merely a matter of ignorance? I wouldn't say it's a matter of ignorance in some static sense. You might ask. Could someone equipped with the right set of tools, the right set of methods, the right set of simulation models, for example, not be surprised? Um, um, I would say, yes, in principle, with the right set of tools for examining them, one could, in most cases, anticipate many of these uh these these effects that seem surprising to others not all there are chaotic systems where anticipating behavior is challenging there are systems whose stochastics um lead them to alternate between different outcomes that are uh quite different and that lead to lock-in effects that are uh and you don't understand which way it will end up by happenstance, but it's hard to get it out of that outcome. Um, I will tell you this. Um, so um, when I was at MIT as a grad student, um, there was an active line of research among modeling colleagues there. Um, John Sturman is perhaps best, best known for this, but I think Nelson Repenning also led sessions like this, where they would take, um, so I was in electrical engineering computer science at MIT, and they would take um, PhD level folks from across MIT's engineering and science schools. People who had taken many courses in advanced mathematics at a graduate level, were very, very knowledgeable on paper about different the, the the behavior of complex systems, nonlinear systems. Had lots of training in how to analyze those systems effectively. And they would give them tasks with a complex system that was descriptively simple. It was very complicated. It had only a few parts, but it was complex. Um, and they would give them tasks and see how well they performed on those tasks. And, and particularly ask them questions about their understanding of this system. And amongst those things or whether they were, they were surprised by the behavior. And my fellow graduate students who were solicited in this way for these experiments, with all our training, did terribly. We did no better, typically, than people without that sort of mathematical training. Now, of course, we weren't 
equipped with. We didn't bring along, you know, simulation models to help us with this process. But you would have hoped that formal training in the classroom, in the underlying mathematics, would have given us the requisite tools to think ahead of the system. But it didn't. The human, and what John argues, John Sermon argues, is that the human wetware, our, our biologic complement, is extremely good at certain tasks. Visual recognition, noticing complex patterns and visual, and visual stimuli, making out sounds, etc. We're, we're extraordinary. But when it comes to reasoning about complex systems, we're terrible. And surprise is almost inevitable. Now, equipped with the right models of that system, I would say, yes, those folks could have anticipated um, much better how to behave and could have taken actions that were much more judicious. And that, Jun Xiao, is much of the motivation for this sort of modeling on um, uh, to be able to be to allow us to behave more judiciously, to learn more quickly, more deeply, more robustly about these systems. Um, it's not perfect. Our models are no more perfect than we are. But they may quickly disabuse us of certain knee-jerk reactions being effective and, and clue us into better ways of behavior. And, they allow us to fail forward, to discover our mistaken thinking, and to correct it, and to correct it. They're tools for learning, um, as, as we'll see. Now, in this context, this, this MIT context, um, uh, you know, we, we did not find that those folks interacting with the system off the seat of their pants with deep background, uh, deep understanding, were, were any better. In fact, they were surprised just as much. Um, but uh, they they had recourse to tools as modelers, which could help them um, decide, you know, behave more more effectively. Um, I will say, I I do believe that without simulation, when these nonlinear systems, you cannot. I I do believe it requires simulation. I do believe that it requires. This these dynamic models that we'll be talking about in this lecture, and indeed that are the focus of this week. Um, uh, and I, I do think finally, and this is important, that um, the and, and John Sturman did a big investment in this. I, he did a big investment. He he undertook a big investment in this principle that. One of the ways of improving people's reactions in these systems, one of the ways of making them more judicious is by giving them simulations to work with again and again and again and again. Much as pilots would never fly a 787 through a thunderstorm without having hundreds or thousands of hours logged in simulators, flight simulators, that allow them to do that with no risk, I mean, you know, um, under simulated conditions, then they have the requisite judgment skills. And, and this too is part of the craft of, of, of modeling, to be able to improve people's mental models and reactions by engaging them early, often, and ubiquitously with models so that they you can build their understanding. Um, and that's one use of modeling um, that was uh, captured in what's known as the management flood simulator literature and basically equipped decision makers with ongoing engagement models to try to improve their decision. And there's some evidence that that, that, that works to reduce surprise and more importantly, to make them more judicious in their choices, okay? Um, so long answer to a short question, but um, hopefully that offered some value. Yeah. Um, so the basic deal is these systems have these characteristics, and that gives rise to certain types of properties. 
They have tipping points. They have path dependence. They have lock-in effects. They have emergence. I could go through each of these, but we'll be seeing them in some example models coming up. We see behavior coming up that's surprising, that's emergent. We can have very different outcomes. The tipping points, things can go from one to the other. And we can have lock-in effects, whereby if it comes about one way, it's very hard to change it to the other way. Certain types of heterogeneity can make huge impacts. So, for example, we can have a small fraction of the population with STIs that has a disproportionate impact in, in terms of keeping the STI, the sexually transmitted infection, alive in the population that would otherwise go, go extinct. Now, all of this may sound too conceptual. It may sound too airy fairy or too, too you know, theoretic. But it's not. I mean, these complex systems surround us in our daily life. We're all familiar with them. We all know, you know, if we are renting, often we that gives us, uh, we're paying a lot for rent, and that sometimes prevents us from being able to move closer to our place of employment, which takes a, a greater toll on the sorts of jobs we can carry down. And that may limit our salary, makes it hard to, to you know, get out of a, a, a high rent situation. A cycle of poverty more generally is a reflection of these complex systems. Traffic chains, something we're so familiar with. I, I'd argued before, relationship dynamics. We know the feedbacks there all too well. We know them very well, both virtuous feedbacks and vicious cycles, right? Um, Phenomena that, that came up a great deal during the pandemic, the very notion of herd immunity. That's not, that's a systems notion. It's not about any one person. It's not about their immunity. In a, in a, in a community with herd immunity, there are many people who are not immune, but the community as a whole has, has immunity. But we see these things, you know, writ large across many, many systems. We see them and, and animal populations and things like population cycles of snowshoe hares and Canadian lynx in Canada's north. Um, and uh, we see them in, you know, uh, in the opioid epidemic, in arms races, in, um, in the difference in the efficacy of a drug and the ecological the effectiveness of a drug. So, you know, we can be an expert in the pieces. I said the pieces of a car without knowing anything about traffic. We can understand each species, you know, particular species well, but not the ecosystem as a whole. Right? We can we can understand how beta cells work, but not by virt or or specifically how glucose is in, is secreted by beta cells but need a higher level of description to describe the interaction between insulin and blood glucose, et cetera. Um, so there's many areas where understanding the pieces is very different from, from the whole. Um, I spent you know, a, a while talking about some of the motivations here. So I, I'm gonna go light on these examples, but um, if one were to look at the food system, um, you'd find delays, feedbacks, nonlinearities, um, disproportionate impacts of heterogeneity lock-in. Um, and sometimes that's been sketched out to communicate its complicated nature, but it's also, it's also complex in, in a sense that goes beyond the complication. It has a whole greater than some of the parts. Another example is emergency department. We may wait a long time in the emergency department but it's reflective of systemic bottlenecks that extend well outside the emergency department. It may be driven in large part because of lack of community services, meaning that people from the hospital wards who are admitted to the hospital can't be discharged, and that prevents hospital beds from being available in the so-called access block and through delayed discharges. And that prevents people from the emergency room getting into the wards of the hospital. And that means the emergency room has long waits. So these are systemic imbalances that lead to effects that we see in the emergency room 
but whose causes lie elsewhere in the broad coupled system. The whole is different than the sum of the parts. Uh, you can't you can't meaningfully answer this question by just studying the emergency department in isolation and have other researchers studying community service delivery uh, and others yet studying the hospital wards. You have to consider them together. And the opioid epidemic is yet another way. Place we have lots of feedbacks, path dependence, delays, nonlinearities, et cetera, systemic imbalances, antimicrobial resistance, yet another. The same basic features, delays, nonlinearities, feedbacks, disproportionate effects of heterogeneity, lock in. And what ends up happening is unexpected behaviors, patterns that emerge that cannot be attributed to any one piece. As early as the 1700s, Bailey noted the, the sort of characteristic curves associated with outbreaks that we know today associated with, with outbreaks, um, uh, such as this from the bubonic plague in London. And, you know, in the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw our share of, from New York City of similar curves um, when it came to things like uh, hospitalized cases here. Um, but it also gave us these different data series that were all whispering to us, to us about the same underlying system involving new cases in brown here, new test volumes in gray, surely related to one another, but in, in uh, reciprocal ways with new cases leading to testing and testing leading to discovery of new cases um, and, uh, and with uh, new test positivity also relating to test volumes in the underlying the underlying um, epidemiology. So we see them uh, in earlier decades of the 20th century, pre-vaccination and childhood infectious disease dynamics, right? And in chronic diseases and things like the network context of obesity or patterning of, of, of health disparities related to overweight and obesity in Los Angeles. So when we have these complex systems, um, we need a broader tool set. Traditional reductionist approaches that prize understanding the pieces. You know, we seek to understand a, a system within a reductionist context by taking apart each piece and studying it really closely. And there's great value to that. It offers a great deal of scientific insight about those pieces. But we need something more than that. Just like when you're going to build a house, you need something more than the, the specialist trades, the, the folks who do the electric, electrical work and the plumbing work and the, you know, the site foundations, the earth moving, and so on. You need a, a generalist. You need someone to put the pieces together, coordinate all those folks, make sure they're working um, in a coordinated way and not across purposes. Make sure all their work you know, fits together. Here, we need to understand the pieces to be sure, but we need to understand how they relate to one another, their relationship, how they interplay, how they're tangled, as it were. Um, and uh, reductionist approaches run into real problems when we seek to understand how those pieces fit together or when you need to intervene not on the pieces in isolation you know, but on the system as a whole and you're seeking to gain outcomes from the system as a whole um and here's the thing whether it's in those experiments that john sturman ran at mit uh involving you know the systematic difficulties even the most advanced STEM graduates face in reasoning about complex systems, um, or or whether it's in in health system uh, context, we we need to make decisions. If if we don't make decisions informed by understanding how the pieces come together to form the whole, we risk ending up um, like the blind men and the elephant, right? Where each of the blind men is finding part of the elephant, 
saying they understand the elephant as a whole by thinking that the trunk is the elephant, or the, the elephant is a long snaky thing, or someone with the ear finding that the, you know, arguing that the elephant is a large, two, basically two-dimensional structure, or the person with the tail arguing that it's it's essentially a thin tube or what have you. Um, this this um, um, is from a mural that I passed at MIT during my undergrad days as I was learning the basics of computer science and electrical engineering. I would often pass this mural and I always thought it was quaint and sort of curious. I never really paid attention. And then as I started exploring complex systems in my graduate work, started um, building models to inform clients who are running a, uh, a consulting company as well. Um, one time I paused and I said, this is about complex systems. You know, this, this, this shows the behavior of understanding a complex system and why we need to understand the elephant as a whole, not merely its pieces in isolation. We need something more than the blinder reductionist insight of each person. Now, again, this is more than an academic. It's more than an intellectual exercise. It's more, complex systems are more than curious, um, mathematical structure. They matter because we need to we need to engage with the world in ways that alleviate burdens that uh, that advance human flourishing. And two big things that we need to do invariably is number one to interpret what's going on in the world. We need to ask, you know, does the evidence that's available from the world support a certain understanding, certain hypothesis? Where is the situation likely to go next? What's driving these increases in the number of overdoses we see, you know, in the downtown east side or the west side of Saskatoon? Sometimes it's a matter of asking, if I see, you know, rapidly rising cases of, of, of uh, you know, of gonorrhea, is that a sign, a really bad sign that it's an outbreak and, and you know, we're, we're having a crisis situation and spread of gonorrhea, or could be it could it be a good thing in the sense that I'm discovering what were hidden cases more quickly, and this is actually a sign of success in case finding. Sometimes it's not clear. Much of the challenge here is that you know when when we're dealing with these complex systems. Often we we have some sort of underlying situation um, uh, that we suspect may be in place um, uh, within the, the system. We have some hypotheses about what's going on. Maybe it's you know adulterate involves adulteration of the the substances in the, in the, uh, the external world. Maybe it involves. Um, lack of access to uh, appropriate health care due to stigmatization, or maybe it's, you know, um, spread uh, of uh, asymptomatic cases of COVID. And we have some empirical observations, and we're trying to, trying to reason whether this data, these empirical observations, are supportive of, of our understanding of the understanding situation. If we're relying on informal reasoning, alone. This is really hard, just like in those experiments conducted by John Sturman with these, you know, descriptively simple complex systems, these systems that are that are nonlinear and, and complex, but don't have too many moving parts. Um, what's behavior is implied by certain actions just isn't clear informally to us. It isn't clear on the seat of our pants. It isn't clear to our knee-jerk reactions. Um, Trying to, trying to reason about this in our head is just something we're not very good at doing as, as, as biological organisms. Um, but this situation is even worse by, because we don't have the luxury of just being observers of, uh, of some external system. We don't have the luxury of just watching things unfold in the world. 
we watch human suffering play out unnecessarily. We see barriers erected that disadvantage groups of people that, you know, that limit the opportunities of our children and next generation. And we want to do something to improve the situation, to bend the curve, to improve it for the better. And we want to ask, where do we best intervene in this system? How do we best intervene? Through what pathways? What particular mechanisms? How soon will they will we see effects? Too many interventions have run have have run into um, uh, problems um, with continued funding investment have been declared failures before they they have any realistic chance of of being able to show effect. The time constants by which people expected effects are completely incompatible with the reality of how long it naturally takes the natural time constant to show effects. People want to know, how do I scale up an implementation of an intervention? Um, how do I make it financially sustainable, this intervention? Um, these, are, these are practical questions, and, and they pose quandaries for us when we're operating off the uh well the, uh, the the seat of our pants so yes jared the venture paradox if you do successfully intervene with something that's like, right. oh we wasted all that money doing something when beautiful point right covid was a perfect example right we're looking at like five percent uh, death right for covid that's right and so in the u.s it's like well only six hundred thousand people died well hold on that's because we implemented that's exactly right yeah, these and there's a there's a wonderful, a, a brilliant point, and um, there's a paper I often cite um, to my students in this regard, which is um, uh, I think uh, written many years back by two MIT professors I've mentioned, John Sturman and Nelson Rokemi, and um, it it was an industrial context, but the the comment from one of the stakeholders. Um, was that nobody gets credit in this world for preventing fires that never happen. Nobody, so people get credit, rightly so, for being a hero rushing in to extinguish a fire, right? Um, being the hero helps extinguish it, helps rescue people from the fire, um, helps limit it spread. That's recognized as, rightly so, as heroic. But nobody gets credit for something that's an even deeper, more substantive, bigger contribution, which is if you can prevent that fire from ever happening in the first place. And the paradox that Jared is, is highlighting is that very act of preventing it leads people to doubt the value of that prevention, right? Why, why, do you, why do you have all these fire extinguishers around? We haven't had a fire here in, you know, in, in 20 years. Um, uh, why are you putting all this money into this, but there's no record of a fire having happened recently? Well, there's no record because we're making these investments. Nobody ever gets credit for preventing fires that never happen. And there's something deeply unsettling about this, right? Because when we succeed, it leaves people to doubt most the value of our efforts. And simulation models are one of those tools by which you can ask about a counterfactual, by which you could ask, well, if we, if we didn't make these investments we in fact have made, what would have been the consequence? And you won't get a perfect answer, but you'll often really improve your understanding of what we've prevented, right? And you have some basis, some evidence-based basis of, of bringing something forward and saying, look, um, we believe that we avoided this this much bigger calamity by this. But it it is one of these things about the nature of simulation that belies a common mis, a common misperception about simulation. And I'm so grateful for Jared to you know surface this when we when we um go and talk with people in the 
broadest population, or talk with the decision makers with, during my secondment, you know, to the health system during the pandemic for a year, year and a half, um, when I was working within the health system. One of the most common, and I would argue most pernicious perceptions, were that simulation models were or aspired to be, and were to be judged as whether they're effective crystal balls. Do they tell you the future? They're going to tell us where what's going to happen. And one of the key points related to Jared's comments here was that is that the most successful simulation models in the policy context are often those that make themselves less accurate by motivating action that changes the, the underlying situation. They undertake action that changes what they anticipated might happen for the better. Um, and by so doing, they become less accurate because they have lowered um, some of the risks by virtue of that model. So sometimes modeling can undercut its own accuracy and therefore its own perceived credibility by motivating action. Useful models can get used. So do you buy into the all models are wrong, but some models are useful? I buy into that. Um, I, I will sometimes use that term. I think it's a bit glib. Um, I think, um, and probably in later slides here, there's a there's an analogy. I, I think of models like Max in some way. It, models can be analogized to many common things for the sake of building some understanding. And one of them that I feel to is, and to a degree, models are like maps. They, they, they try to depict some external situation often. And they, in so doing, they often, they, they need to, to be valuable, to deliver value, they have to leave out some details. And what, what details they leave out depends on the purpose of the model. Right? If you have a map of the city for flood control, it's a very different map than if you want to, you have a map of the city to take public transit and a very different map than if you want to bike, bike around or if you want to take your car. Um, and models are very purpose specific. They leave out details and they're useful because they leave out details. I wouldn't call a map wrong if it leaves out details. You know, if I have a map of the city, um, geared toward bikers. I don't call it wrong because it doesn't show all the subway paths in Toronto or something like that. I don't say that map is wrong. Um, and and that's why I, I have, that's one of the reasons I have a certain, I think it's a bit glib to say it's wrong. I, I think that loads it normatively with it, it, with a certain, sounds like, oh, it's bad, but actually, um, it, um, all models are simplifications of the world. All models leave out details and um, and do with necessity represent approximations, but um, I wouldn't call them as be being wrong, but they can be very useful and they can differ in their utility. Yeah, so I, Thank yeah, thanks. Um, okay, um, so, you know, when it comes to making choices when it comes to to um intervening we've we've an especial quandary tradition right um uh, on the on the one hand what we want to be able to reason about the system the system's underlying situation without interventions but now we have to ask okay how would our interventions affect that underlying situation and what what dynamics be applied by that? And to what degree do those map our desired outcomes for the system? So we, we we not only have that earlier problem we had where we we have a, a you know challenge enough in reasoning about what's this underlying sis, uh, uh, situation in the system? What are, are our hypotheses uh, uh, sound about what's going on in the world? Our theory of the world is it sound? Here we 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 need a theory of the world, and we want to be able to to reason about it. But we also want to ask how would interventions affect that, such that we get the desired outcomes. And just like in those experiments led by John Sturman, um, when it comes to try to 
interact with a complex system to achieve things on the seat of the pants, off the top of their head, based purely on informal reasoning, even very, very talented, mathematically knowledgeable individuals are very poor at achieving desired outcomes. Um, so it's not consistent with our wetware. Now, the consequences of this are writ large. The consequences are um, uh, are pervasive and, and, and serious, right? Misperceptions of the situation. Unanticipated responses to our policies. Blowback sometimes. Ripple through effects we didn't anticipate. Um, and gaps in understanding get in the way of coordination of different parties of the system, cross-sectorally or even within the health system. Upstream, downstream, you know, acute care versus community-based care, public health um, and, and population health, et cetera. Um, uh, it's, it's a challenge for planning and deciding um, uh, in, in investments and in designing systems. Um, and it can lead to policy resistance. What, what is sometimes ter uh, the term for cases where we undertake an action and it uh, dilutes, delays, or defeats that original goal um, by virtue of its um, unanticipated effects. These are features of complex systems when we are not um, equipped to be judicious in our, our, our reasoning about those systems. So complexity matters. It matters in terms of getting to our goals. Complexity, if not respected and addressed properly, can leave us far, far short of our goals and can even reverse our progress towards those goals. Um, so uh, back in the in the nineties, uh, doing doing work, working with clients uh, with with modeling um, to improve decision making, uh, I came across this. Uh, you know, this slide, which which depicts a situation where we have a well-resourced situation, but there's some systemic imbalances, right? We have, on the one hand, kind of acute care with all these brawny folks and community care over here, and the ship goes around in circles as a result. The problem is not that there's not enough resources. It's that there are systemic imbalances in the resources that lead to adverse behavior that lead us to not get where we wanted to go, right? Um, and uh, it's an example of the sort of behavior that can result when a system is not, uh, is, is invested in um, uh, purely considering the pieces and not the, uh, the, the interrelationship between these pieces. And I'd like to use the example, Jeff McDonald um, liked, liked my analogy of King Canute here. Um, so King Canute was a uh, mythical, I believe, um, I, I, I'm not sure that he has a historic uh, figure to him, uh, English king who was fairly wise, um, but he had a lot of yes men as advisors. And in those days they were men, um, unfortunately, <laughs> all men. And they were telling him of his great majesty and strength and saying that, you know, um, everything within your kingdom obeys your wishes. And he said, oh, come on. you know, um, are you telling me like the ocean obeys my wishes? Um, and they said, yes, your Lord. Yes, your, your, your uh, sire, uh, the ocean, uh, the ocean will obey. You. So he had them take him down to the strand, to the beach. And he said, okay, um, I'm going to order back the waves. And he ordered back the waves, and of course, they didn't respond, right? Because he wasn't working with the nature of things. He wasn't working with how the world actually works. And um, he proved his advisors to be flatterers and yes men. Um, but King Canute, um, uh, unfortunately, came many centuries too early to tap in to one of the more signal advancements of the past century, which has been the arising of systems, the science of the whole. And a key, and, and this is really important for those coming from uh, a different background in health science, more traditional background. Um, 
system science um, differs in many particulars from the quantitative traditions most emphasized in the health science. It's not opposed to them. No, no, no. It works together with them. But it's very different in its stance and orientation. And it requires an appreciation of that to approach it properly. Um, one of the features of system science, of uh, one of the foremost sort of um, uh, hallmarks of system science is the fact that it puts an emphasis on understanding the underlying processes. Um, including data generating processes that that work out there in the world, um, uh, the underlying mechanisms. Um, and the idea here is that look, patterns of ill health and, and health disparities across many conditions result from underlying mechanisms, underlying causal pathways, under, underlying uh, processes. When I say underlying, I mean, we don't always observe them. Often we don't observe. We just hear whispers of them through the data sources that we do have. If we collect more data, we may know some more uh, about certain pieces, but it's an underlying system that, that proceeds um, in ways that aren't dependent on us collecting data about. It's kind of a critical realist um, uh, perspective that is articulated with modeling, for those familiar with that philosophy. Um, and to understand why patterns persist, patterns of health inequities, patterns associated with, with um, uh, uh, counterintuitive effects of interventions, um, we, we need to reason about this underlying situation. And the idea is that if we don't reason about the reality of, of, of the processes in the world, we'll often end up like King Canute seeking to order back the tide in ways that will not be effective. Um, so what does system science help us with? Well, many tasks that help us with are to understand the, uh, the underlying processes and to be wiser, more judicious about reasoning about them, to be less fraught with um, uh, mistaken notions. It's not that we disabuse ourselves of all mistaken notions, but we more quickly identify when our notions are off. We, we have a tool for rooting out mistakes in our thinking more quickly. Um, and we can test consistency of our evidence with, with our reason. So the analogy I'd like to give here, which is perhaps a bit overdramatic, but um, I think it brings home the point, is that all too often in traditional health sciences, we've been party to and, and sort of um, um, privileged or 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 or, or um, uh, put at at the top of our attention, reasoning about the associations in data um, collected from the world empirical data. Um, we we test hypotheses uh, uh, against these associations. We, we study um, how they uh, change uh, in light of certain stratification of our population. We're dealing here with empirically collected data um, from the world. Um, and from a system science perspective, that data are shadows. Those are shadows cast by an underlying situation, which is not directly observable here. So in uh, Plato's uh, metaphor of the cave, um, here you have these prisoners, and they don't see the underlying situation. What they see is these shadows cast by it. These kind of epiphenomenal, these kind of um, uh, outcomes of that underlying process, but they don't get to witness the underlying process directly. Um, and these prisoners get caught up in this world of the shadows, thinking that it is reality and reacting to it, not realizing that it's just actually uh, a, um, uh, a shadow of the underlying situation, a, a sort of um, crude uh, outcome of the underlying situation. And if they understood the underlying situation, um, they would get less caught up in these um, in the particular narrative being depicted by the shadows. 
And in Plato's cave, some of them come to escape and see the broader world and understand um, more deeply the nature of the, the, the reality that was hidden from them. I'm, of course, doing a disservice to Plato's story, but um, the idea here is that uh, in system science, we're seeking to, to focus not on just the shadows we see in our data, the, the data we happen to collect from the world, important though it is, even though it hints to us about aspects of the underlying situation, we need to recognize that it speaks, it whispers to us, it hints to us about an underlying situation, and to be able to, 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 to inquire about that underlying situation. And a central way of doing this is through dynamic models, which weave together some representations, some hypotheses concerning system structure that allow us to, to reason systematically about this underlying situation and develop develop understanding of that that captures uh, possible um, dynamics within that situation, um, possible behaviors um, that go beyond just what we see in the data. So within system science, system science is broad discipline. Um, it has many substances, um, uh, including aspects of critical um, uh, critical points and critical phenomena and phase changes, for example, um, uh, explorations of high dimensional uh, dynamic uh, uh, spaces of, of dynamical systems, et cetera. Um, and I would argue actually category is, is part of it for those who are, who are familiar with our work there. Um, but uh, here, uh, we're going to be focusing on dynamic models specifically. And dynamic models are a piece of system science. They're, they're one component uh, that's particularly important on a day-to-day -day level of the system science toolbox. And here's the stance I want to emphasize here, that dynamic models uh, are very frequently operationalized, so they're concrete dynamic hypotheses. So they, they capture theory about some underlying system in the world. There are simplifications, to be sure. That theory is a simplification of the understanding of the world. Um, but we build an explicit characterization of, of our understanding of that system. It's simplified, but it captures structure at a level that tells us about the possible behaviors of the system beyond what we see from data alone. And critically, this is a, we are positing causal structure so we can reason about counterfactuals. This gets back to Jared's point. What would happen if, what would have happened if we didn't invest in these prevention initiatives? What would happen if we invested more in them? What would happen if we uh, engaged in secondary prevention and, and tertiary efforts as well? Or what happened? What if we supplemented prevention and frontline treatment in a balanced way, or what have you. The point is we can ask what if questions because we are representing some theory of the world in our models. Um, and the idea of this vis-a-vis -vis reason in daily life is that um, often we have, we are working models of how the world works in our heads. These prisoners within Plato's analogy of the cave here have a, a theory, a mental model of what's going on here that, that um, attributes to the shadows more reality than they really have. Um, so we have mental models that depict some situation in the world and our, our simulation model captures those mental models, often collective mental models of many parties in ways that help us debug these, if, if I can use a technical term. They help us challenge them. They help us um, more quickly spot issues within our mental models. Now, sometimes this is a result of merely having the model articulated, merely having it characterized, not in our head, not in a way that's opaque or inchoate, not hidden in my head and Wade's head and 
and Nona's head and, and Jenna's head, each of us having this the solitude of a model, but instead taking it out and having a shared model, something that we can point to, argue about, critique, um, and, and challenge. So having it in a transparent form, articulated visually, often welcomes understanding. It brings out understanding. Sometimes it's as simple as this, you know, drawing out a, a diagram. But often we make use of more structured diagrams that have more that have more information packed into them. This is a causal loop diagram um, in a tradition that Jen, of which Jen will be speaking this afternoon. Here we have the variables depicted with a certain directionality. So we you could say we have more nicotine dependence or less, more commitment to cessation or less. And these arrows represent posited, hypothesized as it were, in our theory, um, relationships between them. And the polarity associated with the given one tells us something about the, the nature of that relationship. Um, a plus arrow, for example, between smoking on the one hand and nic um, here, smoking and nicotine dependence, you notice there's an arrow. These are directional arrows with a plus up there at the top. And what that's saying is that as smoking increase, all, all of the things being equal, the value of nicotine dependence will tend to rise compared to the value it otherwise would have had. That's a lot what packed into that statement, Jen will talk more about it. A negative link, say between commitment to cessation and smoking, says, look, as, as the source variable, commitment to cessation rises, it'll lead by and large, compared to the value it otherwise would have had, all those other things being equal, as commitment to cessation rises, smoking will tend to go down. So it's as uh, compared to the value it otherwise would have had. So as, as I'm more committed to cessation, I'll tend to smoke less. Now, this may seem very modest, but you can arrive at some interesting types of insights from diagnosis like this. Importantly and critically, um, by putting it in a diagram like this, we can bring out shared understanding of different parties. We can bring out, we can identify differences in understanding. We can identify cases where um, different people who relate to different areas of the system, maybe some with smoking cessation, others with smoking prevention, others with e-cigarette use, others yet with um, understanding the psychosocial um, role of smoking across different sexes. They bring different knowledge to the table. And so depicting it in this form, in a shared form, provides an avenue for more quickly refining our picture, more quickly identifying where there's differences in those perspectives, or more quickly arriving at a shared, a shared understanding. Um, and it turns out that from a diagram like this, you can reason about feedbacks, which um, particularly in the system dynamics tradition are viewed as shaping in that understand the, the dynamics in particularly big way. More structured diagrams yet can be built on this, like what are called system structure diagrams, where we have stocks of flows, um, or we distinguish things or accumulations for things that are, are changes over time. And those provide a great deal of value. But in this boot camp, dear viewers and participants, we will be emphasizing tools from the agent based group. It's not that we can't use causal loop diagrams in the agent. We most certainly can. But often they don't provide us a certain expressiveness um, in capturing certain features, network structures, spatial locations, nesting of contexts um, that, that we wish to additionally capture within agent based modeling. And um, uh, we can have variants of them, and we in my lab have advanced variants. But, but often we make more central use uh, in, in age-based modeling of what are called state charts. And here, 
uh, will learn to read in this boot camp will learn to read and build up um, uh, the structure of state charts. State charts depict, a given state chart depicts for a particular condition, some set of possible states, actions that change those states and the conditions under which those actions uh, are triggered, the rules by which those actions are triggered. So we may, for example, have uh, a situation where we have um, some behavior change theory, um, perhaps drawing on the trans-theoretical model or theory of behavior change, where we have maintenance and action and preparation, contemplation and pre-contemplation, and we have changes between them. Or we may have some transitions between a state of being on prescribed uh, for someone who's a current user prescribed opioids versus street drugs, and some transitions between them. Um, and transitions perhaps to uh, to treatment or to uh, going clean. So a state chart depicts some dynamics of the underlying situation at a little bit more of a granular level here. And uh, per Jun Xiao's uh, question earlier, often early in a modeling process, we make use particularly centrally of participatory engagement to shape the scope of the model. So some of these pictures from Peter Hoffman's work, some from our work and work with collaborators over in Australia, for example, using different types of diagrams to elicit understanding from stakeholders. Um, and uh, one thing that you learn with these sorts of tools, things like causal loop diagrams, is you can draw understanding from people with virtually no background. Um, and Jen will be speaking about this some this afternoon. Um, no background in, 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 you know, but they may lack a high school education sometimes, but they can contribute to these diagrams. So what I've been emphasizing here is this point here. Simply having a model articulated and shared, putting it in front of people in, in some way that tries to articulate structure elicits understanding, elicits critique, elicits challenge, elicits alternative perspectives, elicits, elicits additional understanding about pieces of the system. And that's what modeling is. Um, if, the, if this is critiqued and chained, it's not a failure of this diagram. It doesn't reflect the fact this diagram is false. It's useless. What it what it reflects is that it's not a failure of the mod of this diagram, it's a success of the modeling because you captured more knowledge. You used it to learn. Models, you model maps like this or tools for learning. We will often capture knowledge by showing a tool like this that we wouldn't have otherwise captured. We wouldn't have drawn it out from parties without them engaging with some sort of representation. So it serves to advance our knowledge. And you could say it's wrong, maybe you'd be right. And, but but I don't I, I, I typically don't get involved in that fight because I think it's more useful that to refer to it as a, a step in our learning journey. Um now this is that's about structure. But dynamic models are more than about structure. They're about because with dynamic models, with simulation models, we do more than simply depict a situation. We have a precise enough depiction that we can, quote, run, that we can see what its logical consequences over time. What behavior, to what behavior does it give rise? When we have a causal loop diagram, one of these, we can't do this. There's not enough specificity of this to run it out over time. Over the years, I've had people come to me with causal loop diagrams. Is that could you run this for me? And the answer is no, I can't. I can't run it for you. There's not, it doesn't have enough precision to allow me to run. That doesn't mean it's not useful. It's super useful. Are you kidding? It, it can elicit understanding, it can help us reason about variables that are on many, many particular um, particular pathways or many particular feedback loops. It can help us identify these kind of 
um, keystone variables that that seem to mediate impacts, factorize impacts in many areas of the system. But I can't simulate it. But with a simulation model, it's it's articulated in a precise enough way, specific enough way, unambiguous enough way that I can simulate. What's the consequences? Well, it opens up for us a whole new world of learning. Why? Because by running it, we get behavior that's applied, and we can test whether that behavior is consistent with the shared understanding, the, the experiences of stakeholders, whether it's consistent with base plausibility, whether it's consistent with empirical data. Running it gives us new opportunities to learn from the model and new opportunities to challenge the model, critique the model, advance the model. Mm -hmm. So with simulation, um, uh, they help us understand system-wide consequences of changes in one or more areas of, of the model. So, so simulation brings extra precision to our assumptions. Does that mean a simulation model is more accurate than a causal loop diagram? Maybe not. It's not necessarily more accurate. It's more, it's more precise. And that can help us see what its consequences are and help us more quickly identify an oversight, more quickly identify something where it just doesn't add up to be consistent with the behavior we observe um, uh, in the world. So there was a question here um, regarding this transition from this to, to a simulation model, um, to a model where we can, uh, okay, I thought I had a nice picture of it, but where we can actually run it. And Jun Chao says, just a comment, I personally find it very hard to translate a causal di diagram to a system dynamics model, uh, particularly in the space of public health or health policy. Um, yeah, so so this is uh, a uh, point of some discussion. I'm going to go light in my answer to my comment to this now, but we may return to this. So a diagram such as this captures some high-level thinking about the relationship between electropathics. Now, in my experience, Causal of diagrams like this serve utility in bringing together many types of stakeholders to understand their different roles in the system. That serves a purpose in and of itself to have people who don't normally talk to each other speak to each other. Serves a purpose of helping them understand um, the roles they play within that system, which is, you might think, obvious, but it's often not obvious. They don't understand the ways in which their own actions affect these other parties. They, they may think it's only the other way or what have you. And often it brings out a better appreciation for how, how the different types of parties are connected um, uh, in ways that you wouldn't think would be needed, but often is needed. Um, causal diagrams can serve that purpose. Causal diagrams can also serve the purpose in helping us helping us make sure that we have, we're not omitting in our understanding, our mental models, any big factors that people with lived experience or those who are system stakeholders bring to the table. We may think a relationship is, um, is in one particular way, um, uh, one particular direction, but they may highlight that it's actually reciprocal. Um, and, uh, here, for example, they may say, well, look, time spent around other smokers and their experience, maybe the experience, lived experience of someone who's a smoker for many years, actually leads back to smoking. So smoking leads to more time spent around other smokers. But um, it, in addition to operating through lessening commitment to cessation, may in the short term lead to more smoking. Um, uh, they may bring up uh, that issue. They could also bring up uh, someone who's more familiar with nicotine science may bring up uh, some relationship between uh, nicotine dependence and health, for example, that you wouldn't otherwise have thought about. So it can help 
cross-check the breadth of our mental models, um, help us make sure we're not omitting from our understanding many factors. Um, critically, Jun Xiao, engagement at this level can often build up a sense of having people's voices heard, a sense of having been listened to, a sense of being part of this process that may lead down the road to greater openness to a simulation model's recommendation or to the insights coming from a similar To go beyond it being a black box and, and a feeling that they contributed to this process, that they were listened to, that they were given the dignities of, of, speak, of speaking. And that's that's important too at a human theater level. Very important to build useful models that actually get used and get with, with fixes that come out of them that stay fixed. But, Often this provides only a, a sort of very high level appreciation for how these factors uh, fit together at a quantitative level. And often the simulation models that emerge from this will be about one piece of the system initially. Often it may be a quite modest slice of it. Maybe it will be just this central loop between smoking, health, and commitment to cessation. And for the rest, you'll, you'll leave the rest out for now. But it gives you kind of some picture of where your simulation model, you know, what, what its scoping is in regards to the broader issues um, in a way that has that authenticity of having listened to parties. But you're not going to use this directly, directly to instantiate the variables of your simulation model. Um, that's, that's generally not going to be possible. You're going to use this as a um, uh, a useful sort of um, uh, point of reference in in thinking about simulation models, um, but uh, it will be something to which you can go back. Hopefully, you keep updated, but it's not something which um, uh, which is by itself going to give you that next step to the simulation model. I hope that's that's helpful, uh, Jun Chao. Glad to. Uh, Talk about that for So, so if we build these simulations. You're going to be seeing tons of them. I'm giving you a hundred of them or something. I, I, we're going to be using dozens of them during this boot camp before it's out. How do we use them? This is one of the questions on the survey. People are wondering how do we how do we use these things? Well, look, I've mentioned many of the uses, right? Um, whether it's by manifesting our shared assumption about the structure, by, by depicting the structure, they can say, hey, this is what you think might be going on. You can give feedback by showing the structure. This sort of this sort of thing, um, uh, whether it's depicted at this or this, whether uh, regardless of how it's depicted, showing structure, you know, it, 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 we're making explicit, we're putting ourselves in a vulnerable position to get feedback, to get challenged, to welcome critique, because we can advance our understanding because of that. We can root out misunderstandings, root out cherished prejudices that just aren't, in fact, uh, uh, observed by reality. We, we can root out misunderstandings um, and, um, and misconceptions. But by running the model, we can also do that because we posit this and it shows something that results that's incompatible with what we see from the world. It's just ludicrous. That happens a lot. It relates to June Chao's point and my point about John Sturman's experiments. Sometimes we put together something that we think is a reasonable structure, but it, it results in behavior that is just completely um, at odds with what we observe from the world or what our state public is observed from the world. And, and we, we refine our mental model, we refine our assumption, we refine our theory. So it helps us learn faster and more deeply from, from evidence, from taking these observations about the world and asking, are they consistent with theory? And that's that's really important. Um, but more than that, it because it's a causal, it, we posit causal structure, we posit things about the mechanisms of the system. We posit sort of the pathways by which the system has effect. 
you know, the particular ways in which someone using uh, opioids behavior evolves, the stages of change, because we go out there and we posit some structure, um, we can we can ask about counterfactual sequence. We can ask what if, but if we did this, if we hadn't invested in prevention for, for Jared's uh, comment earlier, what if we invested in this share in this portfolio of prevention and treatment efforts? Um, uh, we can study uh, direct outcomes, cost effectiveness, assess you know interventions that are high leverage, et cetera. Uh, we can try to understand drivers for trends. Not it's not certain, but given if if we have gotten a model to the point that it seems to hold water, it seems to be consistent with what we know from the world, from what our stakeholders tell us, from the, what the broader consultations have borne out. We could seek to use it to advance understanding of trends we see in the world. Why do we see this rise in the number of cl of chlamydia cases? Is it because of, you know, um, hookup apps these days? Is it because of more effective case finding? Is it because of availability of STI clinics that's changed? Is it because of changed social norms are presenting? We can seek to understand these trends, make sense of, of why we see these uh, different types of outcomes. Um, and it can help us prioritize data collection. Where we don't have data about a certain thing, we, we might identify the models really uncertain um, uh, about, about um, what's going on in that area of the system. And if we can gather more information, it could shape our representation of the model, our assumptions. We might find generalizability. We might find areas where we undertake an action in one zone, maybe it's downtown east side Vancouver. Um, and we'd like to know to what degree would that translate to a mid-sized city like Saskatoon. Um, uh, we might find ways in which we could translate success from one area to the other, or scale up an intervention. Um, and we might more deeply evaluate benefits or restructure the system, putting in place cross-sectoral efforts, such as that has been in place for PA with hub-based policing, in the community safety and well-being area with police working with uh, health health personnel working uh, with with uh, population health and with uh, social services and acute care etc uh, addictions medicine and it can support communication and understanding of results and if we've engaged people in the process build um, a sense of shared confidence about a way forward so, so what's going on here? We talked earlier about the challenges of working, you know, drawing on John Sturman's experiments, but also, you know, work in, in our daily lives, but reasoning about informally about the behavior of complex systems, these systems which exhibit whole gradients. We talked about the challenges. Where do models fit into this? Well, look, we talked, if we're reasoning informally, it's really hard to take a theory in our head and ask, is it consistent with the empirical observations? We can use associational techniques to try to do that, but often um, they, they uh, have limited understanding of what behavior is implied by our understanding uh, of the theory and give a very uncertain picture. But with a simulation model, we do exactly this. A simulation model takes some theory of the world that we capture in the model, some particular posited situation about the world. We, we specify a precise set of assumptions about the world. May, may not be right, but this is part of what we're trying to figure out with modeling. And we see the implied dynamics. When I say implied dynamics, we run the model, right? We depict some situation in the model, we run it, and we see some behavior. We're going to be doing this throughout the week. And then we can ask, is that consistent with the empirical data? We don't have to rely on informal reasoning, seat of the pants guesses about how theory would change into, would give rise to applied dynamics when we compare them to empirical data. We simply run the model and we compare that with the empirical data. And we say, does this job, is this consistent? 
does it comport with what we see come out of the model, comport with what we see empirically? I spoke earlier about the challenges of choosing, of intervening in these sort of situations. Choosing interventions. And I noted that this is doubly hard tradition, right? Because we have some theory about the world that itself we're not sure that what it implies over time and whether it's consistent with our data. But then we further have to reason about how interventions would affect that situation. And we have to reason about this in our heads. And again, John Sturman's experiments bore, bore out a time and time again that we're very poor reasoning even about descriptively simple complex systems, system with just a few parts. Um, but if we have a simulation model, we have some operationalized, some concrete, specific, um, runnable theory of the world. And we can ask how would an intervention affect it because it's causal, it's a causally positive theory. We say we believe these are the stages of type 2 diabetes, or we believe that these are the stages of COVID, including a, prob a certain probability to develop asymptomatic COVID compared to, uh, uh, compared to or oligosymptomatic compared to uh, 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 frankly symptomatic, or, or we, we posit stages of change associated with change behavior for substances. Here, we have this concrete theory and we run it simulating an intervention as part of it that changes part of the system. And we see the degree to which it matches the desired outcome, the, the outcomes that, that come from that. Um, so a dynamic model helps us reason through those consequences. And we can ask about different interventions and how those would affect things. So the picture I'm trying to paint here is one that I think is under featured um, in the predominant discourse of models, particularly in the age of deep learning models and you know, uh, black box models. And it's, it's viewing simulation models not as crystal balls, not as attempts to create a crystal ball that's judged as successful or a failure based on how well it predicts the future, but instead as learning processes, much as a physical prosthesis allows us to achieve full function despite our physical limitations, you know, an artificial leg or a, a replaced ankle um, or a, um, a boot that we wear when we, we've broken a foot or a cast on our, uh, or crutches that we use to get around with a, with a broken foot. Um, I would argue simulation models are more like, like this than like the crystal ball. How so? Well, these are physical processes. These let us achieve something close to full function um, despite physical limitations. And simulation models let us achieve close to full function thinking through the consequences of our actions, interpreting things in the world despite our cognitive limitations. They're thinking processes. And I, I you know, said it already two or three times. They help us think more quickly, more thoroughly, more robustly, more reliably through, more rigorously through the implications of our assumptions about the world. They don't tell us the truth, but they more quickly speed us towards the truth by identifying when our, when our, when our thinking is off base, by showing it just doesn't add up to the empirical evidence or to the experience of uh, the lived experience of stable. Um, and, and then they can inform our choices and advance our understanding. Um, we will always fall short of a complete understanding, but they, they help us co-evolve our, our mental model with our data from the world in a way that advances our understanding of things in the world and advances our ability to make effective decisions or at least to avoid bad decisions. Now, here's the key thing. Throughout this, throughout this boot camp, and indeed incubator, subsequent attack of mine, we're gonna be building things. But 
in a real world setting, in an ecological context, um, you know, with actual modeling teams, um, modeling cross disciplinary. Often it's the modeling process itself, not just the model that offers the greatest value. And the, the model itself, even if it were to disappear at some point, um, may not represent the foremost capturing the value. What's often yields greater gains is the modeling process, the shared understanding, the challenges to people's assumptions, the exchange of knowledge, bring to bear different perspectives, um, uh, bring to bear understanding of different areas of the system people didn't know about and, and bringing those to the fore, standardizing terminology, standardizing um, the uh, how certain things are defined in dealing with the data, and in refining the collective mental. Um, so, um, you know, this is something that brings the ability to reflect on what is and what is not known, the different perspectives in the system, um, and uh, and to, to build that as a sort of shared uh, aspect of um, a shared institutional asset. So uh, I I argue uh, from this floor, not uh, an hour and a half thence, that models in a way are like maps. They represent abstractions of the world. Like maps, they're specific to purpose. What we leave out depends on our goals. And, and in some sense, they're, they're, they're wrong, but I would say actually they're simplified in different ways, but it's their very incompleteness, the fact that it isn't the full world that allows them to defer value. The only perfect model of the world is the world itself, and that has a hard time being simulated. Um, uh, but it is something that um, we need to always be aware of that, that we're dealing here with a limited, you know, and no doubt um, um, oversimplified uh, uh, approximation to the world. So we're, we're in the final bits of this, but I, I need to, to hit once again on this point about models and empirical data. From a model, a dynamic model perspective, data, uh, is something that emerges from an underlying process. Um, it's it, it's subject to change. The patterns we see coming out of the system is subject to change based on the internet, based on evolution of the system. You know, the data we saw in COVID nineteen altered radically when we saw different variants of concern arrive. Uh, it altered uh, in terms of death rates when we saw uh, Paxlovid or Dethamexazone um, um, uh, being introduced or uh, the availability of new therapeutic um, treatments um, involving a very serious patients. Um, uh, it changed based on risk perception um, of the situation in terms of case counts, availability of test sites. Data, data in this world is, is um, Helpful, but it's it's shadows of, a, of an underlying process, and those shadows flicker and they 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 alternate, and they're distorted by by features of the situation. Um, they emerge from, in, in the words of statistics, they're part they they're given rise by a data generating process by different regions of a system and and different you know um, reporting from areas of the of the system. Um, and it, it does whisper to us about that system, but it's very contingent, right? It's very specific to context and the current the current situation. Um, uh, and uh, you know, the art of dynamic modeling, um, uh, much of the art of dynamic modeling is to make use of that data for its value, recognize that it's it's really valuable for what it is, but to not deify it, to not privilege it, to not recognize it as the asset around which the model entirely um, entirely orbits. Um, and we have to remember what Jared reminded us earlier about, which is with modeling, we're often interested in, in being able to reason about counterfactual. 
what would have happened if we didn't have prevention in place? How would things change, including the data, if we undertook these types of interventions? Data in this context is not sent from heaven. It's not descended to us and gifted to us as, as you know, some sort of um, uh, having primacy about, about uh, everything we know about the world. More fundamental than data for dynamics modeling are understandings of model structure as captured in those pictures of the model, as captured in our assumptions about things like like this, the, the stages of change, the particular ways in which people change from a current user to a former user or shift between street drugs and prescribed opioids, the, how it leads to people, the ways in which those things influence people's uh, engagement with the care system or being outside the care system due to factors like um, uh, stigma or, or um, uh, challenges with with engagement so so here um with dynamic models we're often seeking to say how could things change so while these shadows are there well we want to make use of them um we have to realize we're in a forward-looking perspective we're not merely looking back to what the data has done as valuable as that is we're we're using the model to be able to ask about possible health issues. And those may give rise to very different data. So we, like the prisoners in Plato's cave, are seeking to break out of dependence on the shadows and be able to interact with the broader world. So, you know, from a dynamic modeling perspective, data is great. Um, you know, much of my pr research program uses data science and, and, and reasons about uh, the patterns in data. Um, in rich ways using all the tools of machine learning and, and uh, statistical analysis and all that is excellent. But it's from a very specific stance that recognizes the contingent nature of it, that this is whispers to us from an underlying process. And the measurements that we have are noisy, they're incomplete, they're partial, they're, they're often distorted, um, and they're non-continuous. And we have to reason about data for, for, for all its strengths and weaknesses, its limitations, um, and recognize it as such as coming from an underlying process. So um, we, we, we make use of data, but we make use of it with both eyes open. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, in these contexts, dynamic model works with traditional tools. Um, uh, but it allows us to, to use those traditional tools jointly with dynamic modeling to best effect. So we use it with regression. We use it with survival analysis, competing risks, recurrent events, and all. We use it with machine learning uh, in many cases. But we do so in a, in a way that's more judicious and that sees both sides, um, recognizes that data is not perfect, recognizes that our knowledge of the world as captured in structure is not perfect. Um, okay. Um, so a few take home points. Um, today's foremost challenges, whether in health, in areas like climate change, spread of disinformation, misinformation, social issues, um, Issues writ large globally on health issues. All those issues are marked by being aspects of complex systems and often wicked, uh, associated with wicked problems that are both complex and involve choices of values. Not always, um, but, but um, um, so again and again, you know, decision making. Um, requires us to grapple with these features of complex systems. And if we don't if we don't adequately tackle uh, those problems, if we don't adequately um, uh, attack those problems of complex systems with the tools of system science, 
those complex features will attack us and will limit our ability to make this. Dynamic modeling provides us tools to represent and reason about the behaviors of complex systems. And in one of the key ways it does, does so is through dynamic models, which would capture theory, not as perfect, but explicit about the underlying system so that we can learn more, so we can disabuse ourselves of, of misunderstandings, of misconceptions. And again, as I've said, of these uh, cherished misconceptions that we carry around as, as, as um, you know, we're confident about, but may just not add up to be consistent with what we see in empirical data or what our stakeholders bring to us or people who are just Models help us understand and, and navigate in ways that are very practical in, in at least two big, big areas to answer what's going on. Why do we see these sort of patterns? Why do we see these trends? Is, is it good or bad that we're seeing this rise? And how interventions might affect them. Um, where we might intervene, how we might intervene, how soon we might see effects, how we can scale up. Models are specific to purpose. They are like maps, not, there's no one right model for a given context. Um, they're models that will inform different types of insights of that context. And multiple and hybrid modeling types, it turns out are complementary for describing these, these systems. Models help us understand these patterns in data and how they could change, how they're contingent. Um, and they have strong limitations. Um, uh, I often close this talk by quoting Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill once commented that democracy is the worst of all forms of government, except for everything else. It's the least bad of, of forms of government we know. It's got tons of problems, but it's the least bad. Now, I would argue that modeling has, has its limitations, has its problems. We'll be talking about them in the boot camp. Asian-based modeling has its gaps. But it may be the least bad of the alternatives by far for exploring many needs, and particularly deciding and interpreting the behavior of these complex systems that lie around us and at the heart of many of the world's toughest problems. And with those comments, I'll stop this lecture and we will uh, have a break and seek to return in, in uh, 10 or so minutes.